Hello, welcome to the course SJPHY1B01 Mechanics 1. The contents of this course is taken from an introduction to mechanics by Daniel Klepner and Robert Kolenko. We will continue to discuss topic from chapter 2, Newton's Laws. In line with yesterday's discussion on inertial and non-inertial system, Assume a scenario where two spaceships A and B are moving in empty space chasing an unidentified flying object, probably a flying saucer. The captains of the two ships must find out if the saucer is flying freely or if it is accelerating. Assume that the two spaceships and the saucer are all moving along the straight line. Okay. Now let's first take spaceship A. How does the captain uh, find out whether this object is moving or not? First he is going to define the position vector of this object with respect to a frame of reference. So obviously he is going to choose a frame of reference which is fixed on the spaceship itself. Okay. Let's call the position as xa. For now, let's take only the one dimensional uh, scenario here because that is the easiest one to understand. Now, once you define the position vector, you can monitor this as a function of time, whether it changes or not. And he finds that the position vector is changing as a function of time. Now we will take the derivative of position with respect to time dxa by dt which is the velocity once again he finds that this is changing as a function of time. He will take one more derivative uh, which is a dva by dt or in terms of uh, position vector d square xa by dt square this is the acceleration. And he find that the acceleration of the object is 1000 meter per second square. Once you measure the acceleration, you can calculate the force acting on the object. The force Fa is Aa into m, where m is the mass of the object. Say this is 1000 m Newton. So this is what uh, the spaceship A measures. Now the captain of spaceship B also does the same procedure. So he identifies the position vector of the object with respect to the spaceship as XB. And he measures the position, velocity and acceleration. He gets a value 950 meter per second square or he concludes that the force acting on the object is 950 meter, 950 mass newtons. So two people are measuring two different forces and you know the reason why this happens, right? At least one of them is a non-inertial frame. If both were inertial, they both would measure the same force because acceleration remains the same in two different inertial frames. Here the accelerations are different because at least one of them is a non-inertial. Now, we can also uh, write down the relation between these three different position vectors. I have position vector of the object with respect to A and with respect to B. Similarly, the relative its separation between these two spaceship which I call as X. So from this figure I can write XA of T because XA changes as a function of time. XA of T equal to XB of T plus x of t. So when you look at the acceleration, take the second derivative. Uh, a derivative with respect to time is denoted by a dot. So when you have two dot, this means this is a second order derivative with respect to time. So x a double dot is x b double dot plus x double dot. Now, one of them is uh, non-inertial. Now, how do you make sure that uh, the frame on which you are in is an inertial frame? So, what does the captain of spaceship A does is he switches off the engine. So, the spaceship A uh, stop moving and any uh, frame of reference which is at rest is an inertial frame. So, now I, I can make sure that 
frame A is an inertial frame. So the force measured from frame A, mx double dot A, I can call it as the true force because the force you measure in an inertial frame is always the true force. On the other hand, if you identify that the frame B or the spaceship B is the accelerated frame or the non-inertial frame, then the force you measure from the spaceship B, mxb double dot, this is known as the apparent force. Now you know the relation between xa double dot and xb double dot. So substitute for xb double dot, you get m into xa double dot minus m into x double dot. The first term is the true force. So this is F true minus Mx double dot. So the apparent force which you measure from a non-inertial frame and the true force which you measure from the inertial frame, both are different. As you can easily make out, if this particular term X double dot is zero, then apparent force will be true force. In other words, if A, if B is moving with a uniform velocity with respect to A, then both of them will measure the same acceleration. We have seen this in the previous class, right? Now, taking this one dimensional condition over to a 3D scenario, imagine that you have two frames. One is an inertial frame, another is a non-inertial separated by a distance R then you can write apparent force equal to true force minus mr double dot, where r double dot is the acceleration of the non-inertial system with respect to the inertial system. And from yesterday's class, we have seen that this particular term minus mr double dot is known as the fictitious force or pseudo force. This is not a true force, it exists only because of the acceleration of the frame itself. So, once again, I can conclude that the apparent force equal to true force plus fictitious force or force measured in an accelerated frame equal to force measured in an inertial frame plus the fictitious force. Now, <laughs> Before going into the process of analyzing a classical mechanical system using Newton's laws, we need to keep in mind a couple of important points. The first one, uh, uh, I have also said this in the previous class, uh, mass is no more a constant, especially when particles start to move with relativistic speed. Relativistic speed means speed comparable to the speed of light, which is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. So in reality, when a particle is at rest, its mass is uh, can be called as m0, which is the rest mass. But when the particle starts moving, its mass is going to be different. So the moving mass is related to the rest mass m0 as m equal to m0 divided by square root of 1 minus v square by c square. Now, most of the particles or most of the classical mechanical system which we encounter in our day-to-day -day life, their velocity is very, very small compared to the speed of light. For example, even if you take the fastest supersonic jet on Earth, its velocity is going to be somewhere closer to 1000 meter per second, which is way less than 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second, right? So when V is much smaller than C, this term V square by C square becomes almost zero, then I can say M is almost same as M naught. So even though these two masses are different, for all practical purposes, I can assume that the mass of the object is a constant. And second point, Newton's laws describe the behavior of point masses or Newton's laws can be applied only to point masses. So in the case where size of the body is small compared with the interaction distance, this works perfectly fine because we know that Newton's laws can be 
used to understand planetary motion, for example, the rotation of Earth around Sun. Clearly, Earth and Sun are not point masses, they are large bodies, but compared to the distance between Sun and Earth, their size looks really, really small. Right. Now, does this mean that I cannot use uh, Newtonian mechanics to study large systems? Fortunately, this uh, the point mass consideration is not a strict one. We can still use Newtonian mechanics in the case of large bodies uh, because we can generalize Newtonian laws depending on the size of the system under study. And the third point, the Newtonian laws deal with particles. In other words, Newtonian laws work best when we study the motion of particles and these are poorly suited for describing a continuous system such as a fluid, which means we cannot directly apply F is equal to ma to a fluid because in the case of a fluid, both the mass as well as the force are continuously distributed. Now, does this mean that Newtonian mechanics are completely useless when it comes to fluids? No, you can always custom make new tools using the fundamental principles of Newtonian mechanics. That's how the field of fluid mechanics was developed borrowing the underlying principles from Newtonian mechanics. Now, physics as a branch of science, uh, as you understand, it deals with the nature and natural phenomena, study of nature and natural phenomena. And our knowledge about nature and natural phenomena is going to be incomplete without quantitative information. For quantitative information, we need to measure the parameters or uh, certain properties okay, or certain quantities. Now, all the quantities in physics which are capable of being measured directly or indirectly are called physical quantities. And to measure a physical quantity, we need some standard reference of the same kind and these are known as fundamental standards. Now, if you do not have a fundamental standard, what happens? Suppose you want to measure a particular length. So, you go to one person, he may measure the length using a meter scale. You go to another person, he may measure the length using his, uh, his hand. Or someone else measure the same length using his food stem, right? And clearly, these three measurements, even though they are measuring the same length, the result is going to be slightly different or the results are going to be inconsistent primarily because the standards they employed were inconsistent. So you need a same standard throughout the group. Right? Now, how do you choose a standard or what is a standard first of all? For example, in the case of length, I am going to choose one meter as the standard unit. Now you need to define one meter. If you know that a jackfruit tree on earth uh, grows to a height of 10 meter at the end of fifth year okay. and you know that everywhere on earth a five year old jackfruit tree grows exactly to 10 meter. Now you can choose a jackfruit tree as a standard for defining the unit of length. So I am going to define one meter as one tenth of the height of a five year old jackfruit tree. So, this is one way of defining a standard. Now, when you choose a fundamental standard, it should have certain characteristics. First one, it should be easily accessible because you are defining a standard so that people can make measurements using that standard. So, people all over the globe need to make measurements. So your standard must be accessible throughout the globe. So if you go back to the previous example, if I choose uh, a jackfruit tree as a, as a standard for length, and if it grows only in India, nowhere else, then I cannot choose this as a uni universal standard. Right? It should be available everywhere. Second one, it should be highly precise. Uh, 
the chances of error should be very very small third one it should be accurately reproducible you make a measurement in india you make a measurement in antarctica both should be same or if you make a measurement someone else make a measurement after 5 years you should get the same result it should be reproducible and the last one the standard must be invariant with respect to time place and environmental condition for example previously people used to use the rotation of earth about its own axis for defining time or defining second but the rotation of earth about its axis this is not uniform during different periods in a year the rotation speed may vary slightly on the other hand if you look at the rotation of earth about sun that is more consistent it is unaffected by atmospheric changes or other external factors so people started using earth's rotation around sun as a standard for defining a second in physics there are seven fundamental physical quantities they are length whose unit is meter mass kilogram time second temperature kelvin electric current ampere luminous intensity candela and amount of substance which is defined in terms of mole so these are the fundamental physical quantities there are also several other quantities which is nothing but a combination of these physical this fundamental physical quantities so those are known as derived units for example velocity which is nothing but length divided by time or density which is mass divided by volume or mass divided by length cube now coming to the physical standards or fundamental standards they are of two types one is uh, man made for example one of the real standards for meter was the separation between two scratches made on a platinum iridium bar so this is a man made standard man made standards suffer from a number of disadvantages first one the standard must be carefully preserved so this platinum iridium bar was preserved at the international bureau of weights and measures in france now if you want to make a measurement in india clearly you cannot use this original bar you need to make a replica of this bar in other words you are using a secondary standard which causes a loss of accuracy furthermore the precision of man made standard is intrinsically limited you can reach a maximum of one part in 10 to the power 8 or 10 to the power 9 now what is the meaning of an error of one part in 10 to the power 8 in terms of length when you measure 10 to the power 8 meters you are going to make an error of plus or minus 1 meter alternatively you can have a natural standard for example for uh, defining time you can use the frequency of electronic transition happening inside an atom so an atom exists naturally in the world so you can use a natural standard and in fact most of the standards in physics are now natural let's uh, briefly discuss about the evolution of uh, standards in the case of three fundamental uh, quantities one is length one is time and one is mass as you know the fundamental unit of length is 1 meter and originally 1 meter was defined as 110 millionth of the distance from the equator to the pole of earth along the dunkirk barcelona line now how how this definition came up the circumference of earth is 4 into 10 to the power 7 meter and the distance from north pole to equator is 1/4 of the circumference which is 10 to the power 7 meter and the power 7 is 10 million meter so 110 million of this is 10 to the power 7 divided by 10 to the power 7 which is 1 meter so this is the original definition but as you can easily make out it's a difficult to measure the distance from equator to pole very accurately so this definition was not very accurate 
So in the year 1889, people modified the definition of one meter. So it is redefined as the separation between two scratches in a platinum iridium bar, which is preserved at the International Bureau of Weights and Measures in France. Once again, even though the accuracy was better compared to the previous definition, there is still room for improvement. So in the year 1960, people redefined this as 1650763.73 wavelengths of orange red line in krypton 86 atom. Now the accuracy improved to a few parts in 10 to the power 8. Finally, in the year 1983, once again, the definition was modified. This is now the length traveled by light in vacuum during a time interval of 1 divided by 2997924586 seconds. Now, uh, what is the meaning of this definition? You know, the, the speed of light in vacuum is exactly 2997924586 meter per second, which means in 1 divided by 2997924586 second, light is going to travel exactly 1 meter. And this is the most accurate definition of meter. It has an accuracy of 1 part in 10 to the power 8 meter one part in 10 to the power 8 which means when you measure 10 to the power 8 meter or 1 lakh kilometer the error is going to be maximum plus or minus 1 meter. Moving over to time the unit of time is second and originally one second was defined as 1 divided by 86,400 of the mean solar day. So this was the definition until 1956, then later in the year 1967, it was redefined as a time required to execute 91926317770 cycles of a hyperfine transition in cesium-133. So people used an atomic frequency to define the standard of time. And this transition frequency can be reliably measured to a few parts in 10 to the power 12. So if you were to make a clock using a cesium-133 atom, then the clock is going to make an error of 1 or 2 seconds only after 31,709 years. So by far this is the most accurate physical standard. So time is the most accurately determined fundamental quality. Moving over to mass, the unit of mass is 1 uh, kilogram and 1 kilogram is defined as the mass of 1000 cubic centimeters of water at a temperature of 4 degree centigrade. And this was a, a difficult to measure standard so later on in the year 1889 the definition of kilogram is changed to mass of a platinum iridium cylinder with equal height and diameter 39 centimeter each which once again is maintained at the international bureau of weights and measures in france so this is a picture of that platinum iridium cylinder and this has an accuracy of one part in 10 to the power 9 so if you measure 10 to the power 9 kilogram, the error is going to be maximum plus or minus 1 kilogram. So of the three fundamental units, only mass is defined in terms of a man-made standard. Other two are based on the natural phenomena. So this is an actually an old story because very recently in the year 2018, the definition of kilogram is once again changed. It's no more based on a physical object or a natural phenomena. The new definition of kilogram is based on a physical constant known as Planck constant. So you can do this as an assignment or a homework. You can read on what is the new definition of kilogram. Why was the old definition uh, changed and Instead of choosing a physical object or a natural phenomena, 
why, why are we defining it in terms of a physical constant? So you can read it up. Everything is available on internet. So that's for today. In, in the next class, we will discuss about some of the examples of uh, or some of the applications of uh, Newton's law in understanding classical mechanical systems. Thank you.